Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And I'm excited for today's guest. I'm going to introduce in a second. I was joking around. She is a superhero, a real life superhero, Lady Goldwire. But before I introduce her, um, you should check out other episodes of the podcast. You know, this is part of the top black business leader series. And Lady is a perfect example of this. Past guests include Chris Gandy, who was a professional athlete, and now he helps people you know, live rich and, and die wealthy or, or pass on that legacy of wealth. And then, you know, near and dear to your heart, uh, lady, is I'd Wanda James, who's founder of Simply Pure, who actually was, I think, the first African-American dispensary owner in the mm. country, I think, maybe in Denver. No, it, no she's dead. I think she's you in know Colorado. Her? Yeah, Colorado. Colorado. Yeah. Colorado, okay. seen her in passing. Yeah. Um, She's an industry icon. Yes, yeah, totally. Yeah. So listen to that. She talks about the industry and, and what she had to do and is really interesting. And, and there's, there's so many more. So check out other episodes of Inspired Insider. And before I give Lady her official introduction, you know, this episode is brought to you by Rise 25. At Rise 25, I started with my business partner, John Corcoran. And, you know, for me, Lady, the most important thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at a way to give to my best relationships profile them, people I admire, and I've seen no better way over the past 10 years uh, besides podcasting. And so wow. we actually help a business with Rise 25 launch and run their own podcast. So you could show up and talk. We do everything else, but we make okay. sure it has a foundation and strategy so it makes sense for your business. So if you have questions about it, go to rise25.com. You could email us. You know, both of us have been doing it for uh, over 10 years. And as if, wow. as if you're listening to this right now, maybe if you're listening to it in five years, it's 15 years, but whatever. <laughs> um, so check it out and let us know what you think if you have questions. Without further ado, um, I am very excited to introduce today's guest, Lady Goldwire. And if you could email me, just agree with me that this sounds like a superhero's name, that's fine. <laughs> but she is CEO and owner of Bryn Mawr Construction Development Group. And she does so much more than that. But she is passionate about her business because it provides a means for women to be expressive and relevant in the space. It's, it's a male dominated, let's be honest, right? And there's a lot of industries out there that are male dominated. We need a female's touch in these things to improve things, <laughs> make things better. Uh, my wife tells me that every single day. And um, so I know you are a big advocate for mental health. You're a big advocate in for the hemp industry. Um, but I just want to thank you for coming on, lady. Well, I want to say thank you for having me, Jeremy. You know, I wanted to start off with the, you know, the mental health piece. You know, that's near and dear to your heart. We were talking before we hit record about NAMI and the National Alliance of Mental Illness, and you're on the board there. Um, why you have a personal story behind why you are so involved in this? Very, very personal. So my son, um, my middle son, while uh, growing up, I always paid some attention to what was going on, but probably like most parents, just so cut, you know, so caught up in the hustle and bustle of just getting them raised that I missed a few things, I think. And um, as he was being recruited, getting ready to go off to college, he had gotten several Division One scholarship offers. We were so excited. What did he play? He played football. football. He played football. Well, yes. Um, was he looking? We were were in, the Gators looking at him? Yeah. Well, <laughs> he had he had a couple of uncles who play for the Gators. I think nice. he has a cousin now that's playing for the Gators currently. They were a football family, and so um, you know his path almost seemed set, and sent him off to college. And almost immediately in, there were some things that just didn't line up. And as a result, I got a call one day that he had been missing. And in finding him, he had landed himself in the Scottsdale or Arizona jail. And I'm like, what is going on? Get out to Arizona and find out that he had some psychotic break. I brought him home immediately and had him uh, examined and evaluated. And we determined that he, in fact, suffers from schizoaffective disorder. So it's a combination of schizophrenia 
and bipolar uh, disorder, and it's kind of a blend. It can manifest differently. And we've kind of been working through that the last um, seven or eight years. And so, you know, by nature, I'm kind of a watchdog, av- got kind of an advocate um, element to my spirit. Um, I guess you'd call it superhero like. I don't know, but when it's your kid, I think every mom kind of has that. And um, dove into um, where we could get resources and what that looked like. And as a result, I landed on this wonderful agency organization dedicated to, uh, you know, just offering support to family members suffering from and trying to learn how to deal with and provide care for um, their loved ones with diagnoses and so NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, had affiliate offices all throughout the country. I found the nearest one and got involved. I currently teach um, each year, you know, uh, family to family classes that kind of do that same thing in a more intimate setting, teaching uh, loved ones how to care for their loved ones, I should say, family members, how to care for their loved ones diagnosed with a mental illness. And I've been doing that since got right in and absolutely adore it so it's personal because it's personal but it, it it's not so personal because the statistics say one in five one in four individuals are suffering from some degree of mental illness at some point or stage in their life at any mm-hmm. given time and so it's just happening all around us so being able to be a part of an agency that's doing such a good job of raising awareness and offering resources and outreach is kind of my form of, of, of therapy. And, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to do that. What, um, you know, looking back, you know, if, uh, someone's listening to this and maybe a friend, maybe it was, it's a spouse, maybe it's a child, maybe it, who knows who it is. What are some red flags people should be on the lookout for that, that may be easy to miss? You know, for, for my kid, I think when I think about it now, it was, he was so non-celebratory about things that should have been huge to him. Signing to a D1, you know, a, a collegiate program, thought he'd be super happy or exuberant about it. And it just was, uh, you know, watching him have a touchdown and everybody celebrating and, and him kind of out to the side. Looking for, you know, the signs, I would say, just being or wanting to be isolated without really being able to put your finger on why. Um, For me, it was my son really didn't have any light behind his eyes. I don't really know how to explain that, but um, I think parents really know um, Mm -hmm. when when kids start to kind of lose their light. And that was something that jumped out at me right away. Um, The other thing that I would say is just not being tapped into the emotion of being sad, happy. There was never anything in those spaces. And, and, and that was something that I didn't take notice of immediately. But going back and, and kind of replaying it all in my head, I definitely think that was a sign. So I tell any parent at the end of the day, you know, the best, the, the, the only thing many of us can do is the absolute best we can do and, and not to put a whole lot of pressure on yourselves about, what you miss, but pay attention to what you can and, and don't be afraid to ask questions and, you know. Yeah. I mean, listen, when you say that, it's like, I could explain that away in two seconds, like yeah. just someone who's focused and they're just, he's not worried about that touchdown. He's worried about the next touch. I mean, you could totally yeah. explain away some of it's, those things. I don't know. It's a, it's different though, you know, because mm-hmm. while that was you could explain it away, but then it will go over into that space where I tell you about the light. I could never understand why there didn't seem to be any happiness. You mm. know what I mean? It was yeah. like, and how something, yeah, something was something was different. Something yeah. was very different. It mm. just wasn't any life to what what was going on around him. And I'm talking to so many parents. That's the thing that stands out to most of them, especially for the children that are kind of in that adolescent stage, you know, they're just not tuned in and tapped into their surroundings and what's happening in terms of, you know, big life events. They're getting really quiet. You should probably Mm -hmm. inquire as to what might be going on with them internally. So 
anyone check out, you can check out NAMI, the organization yes, and yes. for, NAMI. for more resources and help. And, you know, we were talking before we hit record lady about you taking beatings. Okay. This yeah. is not necessarily physical beatings that I'm talking no. about, but, but, you know, I was saying when you do a search, there is something that says prosecutors drop charges and, yeah. and there's always a story behind these things. So, oh, um, talk about what you were referring to when we were talking. Well, you know, um, in addition to being a contractor, I am also a uh, certified building official for the state of Florida and certified with the International Code Council to, you know, officiate, make sure that when uh, engaged in that capacity that I'm doing everything I can to keep residents, business owners, all of the community stakeholders safe as they more or less occupy uh, buildings and structures we're doing or responsible for overseeing all of the people who, you know, do the inspections and, and all of the engineering and architectural reviews that have to happen in order for you to get permits and whatnot. And what I found myself engaged in was I took a job with a, a city, a, a city that I was born and raised in, but the city was finding itself in a space where they were doing a lot of development, high rise, um, intercoastal development on, uh, or development on the intercoastal. And, you know, with any huge development project, there's typically permit fees that have to be collected. There's variances that have to be granted. There's permissions that have to be obtained. And when you're the person responsible for rendering those decisions, especially if those decisions start to cut into timelines and things like that, it can get challenging. I found myself in the midst of a tsunami and it resulted in me having to file federal litigation to preserve my rights not only as a you know an individual but as a female uh, career holding person trying to just maneuver my way through day-to-day -day activities and job assignments and so we had some equal pay for equal work litigation pending. We had, um, you know, some retaliation uh, litigation pending. It was just a huge thing. It's now resulted in this three year long federal battle uh, or battle in the federal courts, which up to this point we've prevailed. But as a result of that, you know, to kind of diminish the character and, and, and all of the things that you see when you're really in a space or you find yourself in a space to kind of be bullied by, by big dogs, there were, I was arrested, I was jailed, I was under indictment for 21 months. They alleged that I pretended to be a building official, which is completely impossible. And the day of trial for this particular case that was filed in retaliation for what I had filed, those charges were then ultimately dropped. And yeah. so it got crazy. It was a rough 21 months, but to have them dismiss the charges, to have the state licensing agency support me and, and basically find, you know, a no probable cause finding for the charges that were being alleged was redeeming. But it also added some, some merit to what we do and how we do building officials. People don't like building officials because they think that they get in the way of progress but when you look at buildings collapsing you've seen it in las vegas you've seen it we've had it here in south florida where people drive under a bridge and the bridge collapses well what happens is first people that they come get out of the bed at night are the building officials who approved it the engineers who okayed it and you are responsible for the well-being of all of these people people you know you don't know and so you learn to develop thick skin and you learn to remain committed to your obligation and your oaths to preserve life safety. And sometimes you might go to jail for it, but you want to go to jail for being on the right side of right. You don't want to go to jail because you were willing to turn a blind eye and, and pass the buck. And so that's pretty much how my situation shaped up, mm. but it has been nothing, but that has worked out in such a way that it's kind of made me the go-to person for here in South Florida for developers who want to get it right, 
um, and not run up against getting in front of a building official who may not want to pass the projects. I find that a lot of my business in that capacity consulting is showing them what building officials expect so that they can move their project. Yeah. So certain powerful people may want to push things through faster because they have a certain agenda. And when something stands in the way, they will maybe yeah, not let, try and not let it stand in the way. And it's actually funny lady uh, earlier today at an interview, uh, I had Christina Nicholson on who's okay. a media maven. And she, we talked about this, which is uh, the topic of fake news and the fact that uh, bullying online, like we are all news sources now with social media. Right. And right. if you perpetuate fake news, it's just as bad. So someone could post anything they want about you online and someone else could like it and share it. Yeah. And then they treat it as fact without digging deeper into what is truly the fact. And once it's gone and it's out there, it's out there. There's nothing you could do. And I was, I found myself being plummeted by, it was, I was in the paper every other day. I was on the news and you just get, you know, when you do the searches, like you mentioned earlier, it just starts piling up and piling up and you have no way to redeem yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, right I now we do. That's why I'm <laughs> asking about you, it. Now you do. And it's a great thing because guess what? A lot of people don't know that this outlet or outlets like yours is there and how to finesse it in such a way that they can use it to their advantage. I, I spent a lot of time. They kept drilling into me, lady, you're the official. You have to go high when they go low. I'm like, but I'm going to jail. Like there's, there's not a go high or go low. Like I'm going to jail. I need to be able to speak up for myself. And because certain mediums, you don't know how they're going to shape up. People will just shy away from, you know, utilizing the types of resources and opportunities that you provide. And I would encourage anybody whose back is up against the wall, find a media ally research and, you know, just get pinned down whether or not they've been fair in all of their presentations. And if you can demonstrate that they have been, formulate an alliance and, and, and just continue to build yourself up because it's hard. It's easy to get into trouble, but it's very hard to work your way out of some of the stuff that people put out there about you. And having an ally is super important. Yeah. Let's talk about Bryn Mawr Construction. Right. Sure. So everyone could check it out, BrynMarConstruction.com. And, you know, I love the tagline, helping you to build your dream, your, to build your dream, not even your dream right. home. It's just your dream. Nope. And there's some beautiful pictures nope. on there. Nope. I figured I want to hear about how you got into the construction development. But before we do talk about, um, there's one project that is kind of near and dear to your, how, uh, to your heart because of housing opportunities um, in where you were born. Yeah. What did so, you do there? I am born in the beautiful city of Riviera Beach, Florida. It's uh, nestled between West Palm Beach or Fort Lauderdale and Port St. Lucie. But I mean, it is paradise, home to the number one dive spot in the world. Um, the scenery is just phenomenal. I got into construction because my father was a block mason. He didn't have any boys. We, we, you know, I was out there just watching him do what he did and, and wanted to be a part of it. When I think about the project that means the most to me, it was going through those same neighborhoods where I was raised and watching the fact that we could not tip the um, property values in our favor to be able to, you know, take advantage of refinancing opportunities that would allow us to build up and build out the properties. You know, the things that you see in other neighborhoods, for whatever reason, Riviera Beach was lacking. They didn't have the homegrown talent to be able to offer a solution. And so when I saw that there was a chance for me to kind of capture infill lots and fill these spaces with affordable housing and create it in such a way or build it out and offer financing that would a cut, you know, accommodate kind of the type of buyer that Riviera Beach had in those areas, I took advantage of it. And I built some really, really cool houses um, in that city. What it did was we it enticed individuals to come into the city and purchase and make Riviera Beach their home. 
But when we made those sales, it triggered the comps in the area so that people were then able to reevaluate what their homes were really worth. The property appraisers would come back in and 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 give us a fair shake at what was going on around what I had built that was now new. And it just changed the trajectory of my community. And so of all the projects that I've been engaged on, that's the one that means the most to me. And, and, and that's why it really changed the fabric of our community. What was it like when you grew up compared to now? When I grew up, I grew up in that city and our parent, everybody on the street knew everybody. You could leave the doors open. My father, we had a few single moms on the street few older people. He cut his grass. He cut everybody's grass. And we were responsible for raking and picking up behind it. And we thought it was the worst thing in the world growing up, but it taught us how important it is to have your neighbors back, right? Nobody's neighborly. There's so many people now that live right next door to their neighbors and they can't tell you their names. They can't tell you anything about them. And I think you know, you can't have community without first being good neighbors. And so what was different when I was growing up is that I grew up in a community that was neighborly. And what I'm seeing now is everybody is super tied to electronics, technology, not going outside and playing and watering the grass and sharing what's been going on from household to household. That doesn't happen anymore. And um, it's very different. I'm hoping that, you know, with COVID and everything that's happening that should be um, really, really terrible for us all, that it puts us in a space where we kind of get back to basics. Um, I feel like that's kind of what's in the air now. And I'm looking forward to where that takes us. What made you start your own business, lady? Having a really quirky personality, not getting along in terms with rules, processes, protocols that just didn't make sense. You know, I wanted to create something for myself, for my family, for my children that was reminiscent of what I thought we represented, which was, you know, we're a bunch of free spirited individuals. You know, we want to, you know, work to live, but we don't want to live to work. Like I don't, you know what I mean? And I I felt like not having my own business put me in a situation where, you know, all of the hours and the time spent was being spent building a dream and a legacy for somebody else. And I really wanted to try to find myself or put or create a space where I could build something for me and for my family and, you know, my children, their children and see where that took us. And so I'd been passionate about being an entrepreneur for a very, very long time. But the moment that I realized in terms of personality that I didn't necessarily have the wiring to not ask why, to kind of quell being a visionary and all the things that go along with entrepreneurship, I figured, yeah, let me take, let me try it. And and I don't regret it at all. I don't regret it. Liddy, I want to know one thing I see with you is you seem to be very good at managing stress from the outwardly. So (laughs) I'm wondering how you manage stress because as you know, again, before we hit record, typically you're in a studio. If someone's watching the video, they see you're in a car because you had to go out and there was some, and and I don't know if I could do what you do with construction development because there's probably always something you have to deal with. And there was something you had to go out for because you'd check it out and it was urgent. So fix something. So we were talking before we got on the call and I do apologize for being in the car, but we're in the process of demolishing a drive through. And there was some concerns that we may have come in contact with a gas line. And if you're in construction, you know, that's like a mayday. You call everybody under the sun from all the utilities and the qualifier, the person responsible for the work needs to be on the site when they show up so that if there has been some damage done, if they're going to be some fines distributed, you know, it starts at the top, right? So, you know, I manage stress. I won't say that I manage stress well. It's just that I recognize that, you know, you've got to get done what you've got to get done. I've had some really good wise counsel 
I uh, talk through a lot of my challenges with colleagues, people who are similarly situated. One has been um, very uh, hell bent on reminding me to always have the tough conversations first, because that typically eliminates a lot of stress for a lot of people. Most of the situations we have that we're stressed out about, we're stressed out because we're rooted in, you know, the stress is rooted in some type of unknown, right? Something you forgot to ask, something you meant to say, um, conditions that may have not have been discussed and clearly understood by all parties. You know, she would always say, you know, lady, have the hard conversations first. And I've found that that has eliminated a lot um, of the stress, or at least managed what the stress looks like, or what I anticipate it will look like when I've got to deal with really hard situations. In addition to that, you know, it just boils down to, um, you know, what's happening to you, Jeremy, is usually nine times out of 10 happening for you. And when you look at the year that we have had, that we just transitioned out of 2020, you start putting things into perspective. What really is there to, 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 to stress about? I mean, there are so many things that went way left last year. I think every day that I wake up and I'm here to try to kind of do this thing again, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for it. And so I'm not looking for the stress. Um, and if it is stressful, in my mind, I'm telling myself over and over again, okay, lady, if this is happening to you, there's something going on and it's also happening for you looking for that makes you know my perspective a little bit different when it comes to being completely and totally stressed out yeah you come from a different perspective and it if you know when you frame it against other things that yeah. are happening in the world or your life or other people's lives yeah. and it maybe puts it in a different light that um it may not be as stressful as we make it out to be. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. Um, first of all, lady, I have, I have one last question for you, but I just want to thank you. Um, you know, everyone should check out BrynMarConstruction.com. Check out what they do. Check out, um, you know, their about page. Are there any other places online, lady, that we should point people towards? Um, well... I can't say that it's online just yet, but there is a new development in my life. I will be uh, launching in April uh, some teas, uh, CBD-based teas, hemp-based teas that I am very, very happy about. The um, It'll be High Teas by Lady. And is I that the definitely- website? What's the URL? Uh, it, the URL will be, or it's, it, it's the site is enough yet, but it will be High Teas by lady okay so L-A-D-Y. it's high t-e-a-s yes. by b-y lady is lady. spelled l-a-d-i dot com yeah. high t's you know high i can't t's. believe no one else has thought of that that's pretty ah! cool well listen here's the thing you know t has always been the thing um they have a lot of people out there that are doing t's eventually florida is one of those states that is dragging its feet with regard to the legalization of marijuana. Now, when that happens, the teas will obviously evolve, but right now they'll just be CBD based. But eventually, um, as soon as we can figure out all of the formulations, we will be um, really, really tweaking the tea game. And I'm excited about it. It'll be the fun space that I get to play in outside of all of the really rigid stuff that I do on a day-to-day basis. So what I, made you decide on the tea as opposed to any other so you know, a delivery tell, system, we'll call it. So let me say tea. First of all, there's this kind of taboo with, you know, just firing up a joint. I mean, if I'm blank, it's like, what, what are you doing? Especially if you're a professional or you're trying to really <laughs> make your way in the world, nobody wants you there. And a lot of women just don't like the smell and their hair and their clothes and their, but when you think about teas and you think about how, you know, the, the English partakes and them, you know, there's a classy, very um, sophisticated element to it. Right. And so I figured there's a way to do everything. And I thought adding some class and some um, 
color to how you do it. The flavors that we've chosen are extraordinary. They're out of this world. Um, I can't wait to introduce them. But, you know, I just thought that it was a better way to, to, to deliver the product. In addition to the fact that most of my friends know if there's ever any good gossip or any good, I'm always like, oh, I got the tea for you, girl. I got the tea. You got to let me get you on the phone. And so it was a combination of me just being real wild and crazy, but also wanting to put something together that lets us do um, what we want to do in a, in a manner so that we don't lose, um, you know, respect um, for each other with regard to just maintaining our professionalisms and all of that good stuff, because that's what everybody's afraid of right now. It's like, you know, you legalize cannabis uh, in, in Florida, that's the conversation. And we're just going to have a bunch of buck wild, you know, folks not able to get to work on time and do what they're supposed to do. And that's totally not the case, you know, from a medicinal standpoint and all the other things. And so this high tease is going to be okay. what we look for forward to it being and i'm 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 excited about it all right so be on the lookout high tees by lady.com check it out um last question lady um is mentors um you know you said you seek counsel and you have colleagues and people that you you turn to who are some of your mentors and it could be actual mentor like colleagues or it could be just some of your favorite books that have have mentored you as well uh, who are who do you consider either in person mentors or distant mentors? So um, the infamous negotiator uh, for the FBI, I believe, Chris Voss. Chris Voss. Yeah, I have an interview with Chris Voss. Yeah. Oh, do you? Oh my God! Okay, so like my eyes are like I will be tuned in. That is exciting. Like in my mind, mm-hmm. he's probably my best friend. Um, <laughs> Um, every time I get an email from his like automated system, I feel like he's just having a conversation or alerting me to a conversation just for me. So he's one. Um, yeah, uh, his book, Never Split the Difference. If anyone has yes, heard, heard of it, it's, it's one of my difference. favorites. And um, actually, lady, when he came to Chicago, we went to dinner and I was having uh, a, a uh, I already had committed to another dinner. So I asked this group, can I bring a friend? And they didn't necessarily know who I was bringing, but. I was bringing Chris because he happened to be coming through Chicago and, and he sat next to someone and the person was a very successful entrepreneur and he, but he was a fanboy of Chris. And he said, I've bought over 200 copies of your book. I've given them to all my friends and it is a must read or listen to whether it's audible. It is. If you can't read it, listen to it via audible equally as exciting. So he's definitely one. Uh, Melody Dobson is um, another one. And in my in-person life, my mentor is definitely a political activist here locally, uh, Lynn Hubbard. She has been a freedom fighter for social and racial equity issues. And that is also something very near and dear to my heart. And just watching her relentless um, pursuit of equity has been a, um, it's been something to, to kind of be on the front lines and see with her. And so, um, she would be one for sure. So Those talk about, so people don't know Lynn's work. What would be an example of something that you really, what has she done that you really admire when you say freedom fighter? What would be an example? Fighter. Um, yeah. so you know, she's notorious for being very, very outspoken. If I had to align her with any of the old school uh, civil rights activists, the person that comes to mind is Fannie Lou Hamer, very um, much like um, today is actually her birthday. That's that's so crazy that we're having this Mm. conversation. But, you know, um, the things she's always advocated for, um, you know, equal rights in terms of um, what young children children of color are exposed to educationally, um, what they're exposed to socially in terms of just the different opportunities. She was always big on ensuring that um, children in our community, horseback riding, um, lacrosse, things that were not necessarily something that we could get our hands on uh, right away, but just the exposure element. She was really, really on the front lines of that happening. Eat housing, um, Clean water is a big thing in Riviera Beach. Um, it's a wonder we aren't as 
infamous as Flint, Michigan, but it's a real issue. And she's always been an advocate for having those types of things um, brought to the to the forefront of everybody's minds and 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 just advocating to just get the basic things that we all need and, and we all should have um, on a day-to-day basis. And so she's just had herself engaged in some pretty huge fights. She was critical in the um, voter restoration process for returning citizens. And it was before it was, she was in that space before it was a thing, you know, when Chris was, probably Chris was our governor and Jeb Bush before him. And so I've been able to watch her and she's been uh, instrumental in shaping me as, uh, you know, an evolving woman. I had children very young, very young, Jeremy. And statistically, I should not have had the opportunity to kind of land on my feet. And it was watching her and having her kind of hold my hand and tell me, remind me of the things that were important and what I should always believe in and who I should always be advocating for. That shaped my life. And so she's definitely the it girl for me. Amazing. Lady Goldwire, thank you for joining me. Everyone can check out BrynMarConstruction.com. You can go to at some point high tees by lady.com yes. and just really appreciate you. Check out other episodes and thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. You be well. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, nice like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.